Hello my friends, Simon Miller here from a very strange location and I'm gonna be that guy. Given the ups and downs for Smackdown is already live, if you want to know what's going on, you have to go and click that video. Now, am I doing this so you click both videos? Yes, I am. Does that make me a terrible person? Yes. Is there anything you do about it? No. I suppose you could ring my parents and say you agree with them. You're more than welcome. Otherwise, though, thank you very much for joining me as always. And the long version, short version is basically no matter where I am in the world, nothing can stop the ups and downs train, especially because we did just have an episode of Rampage and we're zooming towards All Out. So it's time to give the good bits an up and the bad bits a down. <laughs> Claudio Castagnoli was the first guy out on Rampage this week, and I really like that because now that he is the Ring of Honor World Champion, he's being put in these positions. Now, I'm sure he did do it probably once when he was in WWE, when he was feuding with Roman Reigns, but the fact I can't remember, I just really like Claudio. I think he rocks. He shouted out Ricky Steamboat, who of course was still there after Dynamite, and went on to say, man, I really should be doing an open challenge because I promised that when of all the people, out came Dustin Rhodes. This was quite short and sweet too, because Dustin was basically like, oh, if you want to have a fight, I want to have a fight with you. Because we had all that fights in the other place, and I think it would be great to have another fight. Now, nobody thought Claudia was going to go, no, I don't want to do it, because that would go completely against the grain and completely against the character. So he said, yeah, we're going to do this, and I think it's happening next week. And I did not have Claudio Castagnoli or Cesaro taking on Dustin Rhodes in my 2022 AEW card. So I quite like this, and I bet they have a really good match. I mean, they're both terrific. This was all right. Up. You also found out during an interview that it is going to be Ruby Soho and Ortiz taking on Ty Mello and Sammy Guevara next week, I think for the AAA Mixed Tag Team titles. Now, I do appreciate that we are building these a little bit more than we did last time, but it's still quite an eyebrow-raising scenario because from nowhere, we are featuring them more. Although I have no problem with that. This sounds like a really interesting match with Ortiz and Ruby Soho. Once again, I never saw it coming. It was then also time for an AEW tag team title match, because as they told us on Dynamite, swerve in our glory, we're going to take on Private Party. And while this has completely destroyed the ranking system, I'm not going to worry about that. I am going to worry about the fact that Swerve and Keith Lee are a really good team and that Private Party are finally being focused on again. I like those guys. One day they will smash it for real. This was also really well thought out because of course Keith Lee's first opponent in All Elite Wrestling was Isaiah Cassidy when he grabbed Cassidy and he threw him so high sometimes I go look out the window to see if I can still see him which makes no sense because he was already on my television screen but we teased that here but Isaiah had learned and he didn't let it happen. That was quite smart. He's also able to get the other hand after he hit a dive on Swerve Strickland, because of course he did. That is 2022 wrestling, and if you don't do one dive on a show, somebody just falls down somewhere because they can't handle it. But the real joy is when Lee got the hot tag, and he finally got his hands on Private Party, and he was just tossing them around. Now look, I don't want to get into that conversation, but I'm going to do it anyway. Why anybody would let Keith Lee go, I don't know. Because all you have to do is go look how strong he is, and I was actually laughing. I don't understand, even the world of wrestling, how anybody can be that powerful. I mean, this pounce he gave to Mark Quinn was actually hilarious. He went flying into the ropes, and I was like, man, he's probably gonna get decapitated. When basically Swerve tagged in, he hit something that I think was called the JML driver, and they got the win. Now, I have gone through that a little bit too fast, but this didn't go as long as I thought it was going to because it was Rampage, which is only a 60-minute show, and it felt like we were just trying to put over the fact that Swerve in Our Glory are on a roll right now, although I don't really go know where we're going next because they're not taking on FTR at the pay-per-view because FTR are going to be involved with Wardlow in a trios match. So I'll just give shrug emoji, but was this a really fun match? You bet your ass. Oh. I really like what we're doing with Powerhouse Hobbs too, because we were in the back with the factory who were playing dominoes, where he just marched in, and they were all so scared of him, it just makes him come across like a big deal. The reason he was super mad is because the factory promised to take out Ricky Stark, and they had gone diddly squat, when QTR Shia was basically like, look, I promise I'll do it, please don't rip my head off. And of course, they're not gonna do this, and we'll get to All Out, and 
and we will get Ricky Starks versus Hobbs, but I want to see that. I mean, the feud has been so simple, but it makes all the sense in the world. And I may have said this once, but I'm going to say it twice. By the end of next year, Powerhouse Hobbs will be the AEW World Champion, and I won't be mad at it at all. We then got to the match that had been set up last week, when the FTW Champion Hook took on Zach Clayton. Now look, I thought Zach Clayton did a decent job last week, and I also think that he did a decent job on this show, but I just can't get over the fact that there's a bunch of other AEW dudes I'd like to see in this spot. And that does make me an asshole, because if the opportunity gets handed to Zach, he's not gonna go, no, I want to give it to somebody else. I mean, that would make him a loon, but just as a fan, I oh, don't know, it didn't really work. This was especially true because he got beaten in about 20 seconds. And while that kind of made Hook look like a wonderful badass with his lovely hair, at the same time, it was Zach Clayton. And again, there's nothing wrong with Zach Clayton, but does anybody see him as a threat? The answer is no, not even Zach Clayton. So I am gonna give that part a down. However, I'm then gonna turn this on a dime because we cut to backstage and 2.0 were there. And they are all like, man, wouldn't it be interesting if the FTW title was held by a sports entertainer? And it was Angelo Parker who wrote his name in the sand and says, I want it, I want the shot. And I love those two so much, I really do. They are some of my favorite wrestlers in the planet because they just want to entertain. I want to see Angelo Parker versus Hook. And then I want to see Matt Menard versus Hook. So straight away I was like, oh, this is what I literally asked for 30 seconds ago. So we got to give it up. Billy Gunn then continued his career resurgence when he was doing an interview with Lexi Nair. And while he is very upset what his sons did to him, He's gonna bring the acclaimed to Dynamite on Wednesday and they're gonna spank some asses or something like that. If you had told me Billy Gunn was gonna be doing this back in 1998, I wouldn't have believed you, but I shall tell you straight, this is the best version of Billy Gunn ever. Don't at me. We also then got a quick video reminding you that Andrade and Roosh had turned on Dragon Lee at the end of Dynamite. And as it turned out, the reason they had to rush that, <laughs> I'm gonna get fired, was because basically they had run out of time and the match had gone a little bit long. Now I am glad that we did this, because that's a serious big deal. And it makes me wonder what we are gonna do with Dragon Lee next. And we basically turned Roosh and Andrade into mega heels but we gotta wait and see. The coolest thing then happened and made me look like an absolute goober, because AEW were like, oh wow, we didn't think the hook match was gonna be that short, so we have a standby match, and it's Buddy Matthews versus Serpentico. I just love little things like that, because it makes the whole thing feel real. It was also awesome to see Buddy properly back in the ring, and also, as we've chatted about before, when you do look at Serpentico, you have to question if it is Serpentico, because so many times in the past, it hasn't been flubbing Serpentico. We do have to be honest, however, and this was just another squash, which kind of makes your brain go nuts, because you're like, wait a minute, we had this match because the other match didn't go very long, and then this one didn't go very long. And fair play to Serpentico as well, because I swear he is always picked for this kind of role, and that guy is pretty good. He should probably win a couple of matches, but I cannot lie. Buddy Matthews, I think, is an underused talent. So him getting a win here probably allows him to have a platform to build off. So I am intrigued. Also, the House of Black. I mean, who could argue with that? This got even better straight away, though, because Miro worked out after this. And as you know, I love Miro. I think he's the greatest man on the planet. And he got in the face of Buddy Matthews but he also stared at Julia Hart, who was at ringside. Now they got into a brawl pretty quickly, because of course Miro has been feuding with the House of Black, but if you've been watching what's been going on on social media, it does kind of feel like CJ Perry, also known as Lana in WWE, may be bound for AEW, and we may be about to do a mixed tag team match. Now I've thought about this and I've thought about it, and I actually quite like that, because do not forget, when Lana and Rusev were together, they were a great double act, they never should have been broken up, so if we can try and repeat that in AEW, I don't see who it hurts, also I ain't gonna lie, you can do anything with Miro, and I'm gonna support it, but still just the one up ties into what we already said. Lexi Nair was then interviewing Britt Baker, Jamie Hayter and Rebel and this was just to continue on the story we have been doing recently. Britt Baker is very excited about Thunderstorm breaking up which she presumes is going to happen at All Out because of course they're fighting each other. Maybe it will, maybe it will not. This kind of just felt like a little advert, a little reminder that it is going to go down at the pay-per-view course, as long as you watch the pay-per-view, you will know for sure. There was also more coolness after this because Penelope Ford was back on television. I mean, she's been out for ages, I think, with an injury. So hopefully this means she is back to form. And she was taking on Athena. 
I don't think I've ever seen that match before. Once again, though, this was kind of more of a showcase for Athena, because even though Ford got a few shots in there, it didn't go very long. And when we came back from a commercial break, she just hit the eclipse and she got the one, two, three. I did this for a while. I just shook my arms. Like, did I miss something? I guess not. Of course, it was just to set up Layla Gray and Kira Hogan running into the ring and beating her up when Jade Cargill joined them and she had a sledgehammer. And I'm sorry, if this was not done to set the internet alight, then somebody hasn't had the proper conversation. She did indeed use this weapon to smash Athena's wings as well. And even though Athena started to throw barbs, eventually she got whacked with the sledgehammer. And of course, if this was real, she'd probably be dead. It did mean the baddie stood tall, and I do admit it was kind of sad to see Penelope Ford lose so quickly. But what was very exciting, unless I misheard, was that for the first time ever, the commentary team talked about the fact that the man in the box, that's right, we're doing box watch, was Kip Sabian. I honestly hope he comes back to television soon properly, because anyone that is this dedicated to a gimmick deserves something at the end of it. I mean, they seem to be doing a lot of mixed tag stuff, so why don't you put them back together? So yeah, this did feel like, well, it was just an occasion where we're like, we've got to give Athena a win because she's going to the pay-per-view. She's going to take on Jade Gargill for the title. I wouldn't say it was anything you need to go out of your way to see, but it was all right. We're a positive show. Uh, we then just had the weirdest main event ever. We have talked about this, but it was to see who was going to progress in the trios tournament as it was the best friends versus the trust busters. But look, I appreciate the fact that AEW is always trying to push new talent. It's better to do that than forget about them. I do accept the criticism as well that it's absolutely bizarre that when we get to the pay-per-view, we are doing Satnam Singh, Sanjay Dutt and Jay Lethal taking on FTR and Wardlow, which could also be part of this tournament. But look, if you want to do something with Parker Budo and Slim J, then why the flub not? And I'm going to spoil the match for you here. Not really spoiling, because why did you click this video to begin with? Did they win? No. The heels were in charge for loads of this, which made me go, well, they probably are going to lose. And a lot of the focus was on Davari. Now, this is one talent in so-and-so, and he really made sure to get that across here. But I can't help but feel maybe it would be better to take him out of the Trust Busters and let him swim by himself. That is not swimming. It was always Cassidy that got the early hot tag in order to turn this around. But of course, we are trying to push the fact that Parker Bordeaux is an absolute animal. So when he tagged in, not only did he take out the piece of fruit, but he took out Chuck and he took out Trent and he was all like, oh man, I'm so damn strong. I suppose he is. Eventually he did miss one of these moves. So the best friends came together like the Power Rangers to hit a triple drop kick. And they did this again when they fell to the outside. And once again, this is just smart wrestling tactics. You're like, well, that Parker Bordeaux, he's causing us a lot of trouble. Maybe we should just beat him up. And they did. What I really did like though, is that we made sure to involve Sonny Kiss in this. Cause of course they got inducted into the Trust Busters last week. So just when Orange Cassidy was gonna do something off the top rope, Kiss was there. It meant that Slim J hit something off the top instead and it's got a one-two kick out. This then totally won me over because Dan House was out and he started cursing people. And honestly, I would never get bored of this, especially because the curse didn't really work and he got beaten up. All of this fracas did mean that Cassidy was able to hit the orange punch onto Davari, so he was out of there. And then I don't know what this move was, but once again, the best friends reunited or united or did this triple T move onto Slim J. And it was flubbing fantastic. And if that hadn't have been the finish, I don't know what I would have said. I mean, Barrera and Chuck basically held Slim J and then Orange came down with this crazy top rope move. But they did get the one, two, three. They will be going on to the next round. And this was absolutely the right decision. But I still do not understand what we're going to do with the Trust Busters now because they became a foursome. No, no, no. Still, this was a very serviceable main event. And again, it shone a light on this trios tournament, which we should be doing. It's for titles, for goodness sake. Get it up. Which also brought us to the end of the show. And while I'm repeating myself here, no, I wouldn't say that it was must-see television, but it's 60 minutes, man. You really can't go wrong with 60 minutes. I mean, you'd have to have someone come out to the ring and sit on a chair for an hour going, hello, my name is Wrestler, man. man, man, man. And even then, I'd quite like it because that sounds absolutely bizarre. Up. Now, please do leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about last night's episode of Rampage. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Head over to whatculture.com where you can read yourself some articles. Make sure you come follow us on social media. And we have Smackdown ups and downs, which you've got to watch if you want to know, one, where I am, and two, why I'm sweating my ass off. My name is Simon What Culture. Thank you very much for joining me as always. I genuinely do appreciate your support. See you soon.